We are at the final moment, and it's no enviable task to go last after such great speakers and such great performances. But I am delighted to welcome to the stage the president of the Signal Foundation, Meredith Whittaker. Please. <laughs> Good evening. Not only am I following that, but I'm standing between you all in a party, so uh, unenviable indeed, but let's get started. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here with Edri. You all do incredible work ensuring that flashy claims from tech companies and celebrities don't succeed in distracting us from what's important, a livable future grounded in the preservation of fundamental rights, full stop. And I rearranged my travel to fly through Brussels from New York on my way to Tokyo. That's how much I love you all. <laughs> and that's how important I think this work is. Um, Edry's smart strategy and coalition-based approach have done so much to ensure that countries like Austria and Germany are taking an evidence-based stand against dangerous proposals like chat control. And I see Edri as a model for coalitional work that takes its goals seriously. And I will say in real life, I sleep better at night knowing you're here. So thank you and happy birthday. <laughs> All right, so with that, I wanna use this talk to discuss some of what keeps me up at night, particularly the recent spate of regulatory proposals and misguided tech fixes that offer false and surveillance solutions to complex social problems. Solutions that always seem to lump the right to privacy in with malfeasance, and then offer to address bad actions by eliminating privacy. Make no mistake, these are grave attacks on everything Signal does and stands for. Signal exists to provide tools for private communication in a world increasingly shot through with surveillance. We do this by tirelessly developing and maintaining the Signal Messenger app, the only messenger endorsed by the European Commission. <laughs> and by devoting resources toward research that we share beyond Signal to encourage privacy at large. In 2013, the Signal protocol introduced a significant advance in communications privacy and has become the standard for messaging privacy overall, used by multiple other apps. Billions and billions of messages are encrypted using the Signal protocol every day. And beyond this, we've also developed novel technology that protects identity and metadata, which we implement to ensure that the Signal mass Messenger app is actually private. And I could talk about the nuances of our technology and its implementation, how much I would love to work with you to spread this technology to other services to improve privacy. But sadly, today, we have other work to do and other battles to fight. So with that in mind, I want to start by grounding us in some history. Networked computation began as a military initiative, in the US at least, and was largely funded by the US government, who also underwrote the computing industry for much of its history. Cold War fears were an animating force throughout. And then fast forward, and the turn to neoliberal policy in the 1980s was accompanied by the privatization of the internet in the 1990s, which until then existed primarily as a research network. An exploration of viable internet business models followed along with much bombastic rhetoric that rewrote the military history of networked computation with an emphasis on its liberatory potential. This rhetoric, though often inaccurate, was essential to shaping the mythology of Silicon Valley and the popular image of the current tech industry. Now after some false starts, surveillance advertising emerged as the successful internet business model and surveillance remains the foundation of the current tech industry. This model underwrote and incentivized the metastasis of so-called free products and services from search to email to social networks, et cetera. And to power these free products and the valuable data collection they enabled, the firms at the forefront steadily built and invested in massive computational infrastructure and techniques to enable the rapid processing and storage of this data. So this brings us to a key point the surveillance business model trends toward consolidation, or natural monopoly in the language of economists. The tech companies who honed the internet surveillance business model early had the opportunity to accrue massive infrastructures, massive data stores, and large customer bases from which to continually pull data. These are the resources that competitors cannot simply bootstrap. It's kind of why Europe has never seen a tech industry, right? And they are self-reinforcing. Almost without exception, the companies early to this model are now the firms that we refer to as big tech. So at this point, I want to briefly bring AI into this picture. And this is not a sidebar or an afterthought. 
It's no accident that in the early 2010s, when the tech industry consolidation was beginning to calcify, we saw a sudden turn to so-called artificial intelligence. Now, of course, the AI field is over 70 years old, and it has gone through many, many twists and turns. So the question we should ask is, why did it emerge again when it did? This general question has been the focus of my scholarly work for the past many years, and in answering it, we can better understand the ramifications of the surveillance business model. Now first, AI is not a technical term of art. It is a marketing term that has been applied to a hodgepodge of data-centric techniques. Yes, thank you for the snap. <laughs> Second, the sudden shift to AI in the early 2010s had everything to do with tech industry consolidation and the resources at the heart of the surveillance business model. We see this clearly when we recognize that what was new about AI in the early 2010s was not new innovations in machine learning. Indeed, the methods that were applied to prove AI's newfound utility date from the 1980s. What was new were the significant amounts of available data used to train AI models and the power of the computational infrastructure available to conduct this training and calibration. Resources concentrated in the hands of a few private tech companies care of the surveillance business model. So if we look at it from this perspective, we see that AI's primary role has been to expand what can be done with the massive amounts of surveillance data collected and stored by large tech firms. By sprinkling the magic and marketing of AI, Surveillance data could be used to create models of reality, which are then applied far beyond surveillance advertising to make predictions and determinations across nearly every realm of human life, from transportation to education to medicine to confidently offering the wrong answer in response to a prompt, and so on. And it's worth noting that this too produces intimate data. It may not be by direct surveillance, but it still has power over us. It still shapes our lives and it still shapes our profiles. So in short, the marketing narrative of AI mystified, entrenched, and expanded the surveillance business model at the heart of the tech industry. So with this history and context in mind, let's turn again to Signal and what it takes for Signal to operate in the ecosystem we've just explored. Because of course, the context within which we live and function cannot be wished away. This is true of life, this is true for Signal. And for Signal, this means we need to provide a messaging service that works according to dominant norms and expectations and does so in a way designed to protect privacy and reject the surveillance business model. Of course, we could also insist on ignoring these norms, right? But Signal isn't willing to be relegated to the dusty corner of thought experiments that are theoretically secure and private but fail at their purpose in the real world because no one can or will use them. This point gets missed, although it seems obvious in hindsight, a communications app that your friends don't use is useless. So honoring and meeting people's needs and expectations in ways that ensure signal is pleasant and useful is essential to our privacy mission. We'll add stickers, we'll add stories, group calling, whatever it is, if we recognize it as a meaningful tool people use to communicate and we can do it in accordance with strict privacy promises. Now, meeting these norms is a lot harder for signal in many cases. Our surveillance messengers have it easy. They can just dump things into a relational database. We have to do things very differently. It may look the same on the surface, but there's a lot more work and care required on the back end to ensure it's actually private and secure. So it's whatever the opposite of a Potemkin village is. <laughs> now, the product norms aren't the only things influenced by surveillance business model. The imperatives of tech organizations in general are also shaped by these forces. And this means Signal needs to structure our technical architecture, organizational form, and business model in ways that both acknowledge and reject these dominant tech industry paradigms. So at the level of the product, we do this by implementing technical boundaries that make it impossible for us to collect, retain, or use your data. We can't sell it, we can't build ad targeting with it, we can't use it to train AI, and we don't have analytics or trackers or advertising. And we go way beyond other messengers. We don't simply use the Signal protocol to protect message contents, like what do WhatsApp does for some of their messages. We developed a novel cryptographic technique which also protects intimate metadata, like your social graph, who's talking to whom, your profile info. So we take privacy very seriously. Now, to ensure that we're held to these high standards, we make our code open to public scrutiny. So you also don't have to take our word for it. Now, at the level of the organization, we're structured as a 501c3 nonprofit with Signal Foundation dedicated to solely supporting the development and care of Signal Messenger. 
This means that we're transparent with where the money goes and that private companies can't acquire us. And importantly, we don't have shareholders or equity, so we're not being pushed to prioritize profits and growth over privacy, which is a very, very real and persistent pressure in an ecosystem where surveillance is the engine of profit. So these choices protect Signal at the level of product integrity and mission alignment within the organization. But these aren't the only things we need to continue growing and thriving. And here we need to be very real. It costs a lot to develop and maintain high availability software. And these significant forever costs are not widely understood, in part because they've been obscured behind free products underwritten by surveillance. So while Signal won't participate in the surveillance business model, this doesn't mean it's any cheaper for us. It costs tens of millions of dollars a year to develop and care for Signal. And this is a very, very lean budget given our reach and scope. For comparison, WhatsApp has over 1,000 engineers. That's just engineers. Telegram has around 500 employees. Signal, which is by far the most widely used private messaging app, has a team that totals a little over 40 people. Now, they're 40 brilliant people, but that's everyone. Designers, product managers, engineers, building multiple clients for different operating systems, our user voice team, all of them. And we also need to pay for hosting and registration, which are very, very expensive and non-negotiable if we want Signal to meet the expectations of the people who rely on it, expectations that require us to be always instantly available everywhere and to patch bugs when they, when they show up. So how do we pay for this? A big question always, right? <laughs> Um, well, Brian Acton's vision and generosity gave us a gift of a strong foundation that we can build on as we work to create a model for long-term sustainability. And with the cost in the tens of millions of dollars a year, a model for sustainability is extremely important. Currently, we're pursuing a small donor model, believing that a broad base of support that enlists the people who rely on Signal is the most robust option for us, and importantly, the least likely to be suddenly disrupted. But this is only a start. And I want to use this moment to emphasize how badly we need alternative models of funding that can actually support core public infrastructure like Signal at the levels required. Like a few hundred K from a foundation for like 50 pages of grant reporting will not cut it. So we either need to get serious or say we're not serious. All right. <laughs> so with that background and quick tour of Signal, let's turn to what's keeping me up at night. Now, during in my almost 20 years in tech, I'm almost as old in tech as Edry is, I've seen the same conversations emerge and die down and reemerge, and the same kind of magical thinking crop up over and over and over again. The pattern goes something like this. A complex and so harrowing social problem receives attention from regulators and media. Everyone acknowledges the gravity of the problem and the urgency of addressing it. We feel distressed, concerned, and emotional, and people rush to do something. But over and over again, we're presented with the same specious solutions. To right the wrongs of a troubled world, the refrain goes, private communication must be curtailed. Now, of course, the history of computation is littered with cautionary tales of the dangers of mass surveillance and the erosion of privacy, from the Nazis' use of the IBM's Hollerith machines to the US illegally accessing its census data to identify and inter Japanese Americans during the same period, to South Africa's aspirations to digitize enforcement of apartheid segregation into today, which sees large tech companies handing over the data of people seeking criminalized medical care in the US. But I don't think I have to dwell on these histories here. Those in this room know the dangers of mass surveillance, especially in authoritarian times. Similarly, the history of communications technology is littered with the magical thinking of governments that have tried and failed to have their cake and eat it, to create backdoors that can only be accessed by the good guys while remaining secure against threats from everyone else. Well, these efforts have persistently failed. The infamous clipper chip is only one example. Millions of dollars have been spent on dead ends and projects shelved over and over and over again. Because the truth is that any scheme that provides access for us can just as quickly be exploited by them. Hostile actors eager to, eager to compromise critical infrastructures on which the government, economy, and civic institutions rely. Nonetheless, we see this strain of magical thinking re-emerging with a vengeance in the UK's misguided online safety bill provisions, in the EU's chat control regulation, in the data retention struggles happening at the country level, like Belgians and Christian crackdown and questions about whether bulk retention of private communications is per permissible or wise, and so on. Now, not all of these proposals say the word backdoor out loud. Indeed, such proposals have become more sophisticated in the last years, at least in their language and framing. 
like the EU CSAM legislation, many claim without evidence that what they propose is compatible with end-to-end -end encryption, even as they mandate practices that would be impossible to implement without weakening or eliminating end-to-end -end encryption. So this is kind of like a boss giving an employee two days worth of work to complete and saying, oh, I would never force you to work for two days straight. I'm just telling you to complete this all in one day. It's not possible, and saying that, saying, saying that it is, does not change that. Now, others propose an equally dangerous but more novel variant of magical thinking. They concede that backdoors aren't the way forward. Instead, they suggest that mass surveillance outside of encryption, generally pointing to so-called client-side scanning solutions. Don't worry, these proponents assure us. We will scan your messages on your device before they're encrypted, checking them against okay, opaque databases of banned speech to ensure that you're staying within government-approved boundaries of expression. After that, go ahead and encrypt. <laughs> like, this kind of Faustian bargain nullifies the whole premise of end-to-end -end encryption by mandating deeply insecure technology that would enable the government to literally check in every utterance before it is expressed. It also creates new backdoors and vulnerabilities that carry with them many of the same security and safety issues that come with weakening encryption. Client-side scanning poses other problems, too. These proposals, these client-side scanning proposals, all rely on so-called artificial intelligence. And AI produces significant false positives. It can be hacked and gamed through adversarial attacks. It encodes biases and flaws. And there are very few defenses to these. Indeed, the EU is in the midst of negotiating their AI Act that is responding to these very challenges. So on this note, I think it's imperative that we bring the people who have been carefully researching the flaws and fallibilities of AI systems to this discussion and recognize that here, as elsewhere, AI is not a silver bullet. I'll also note that it's been surprising and perplexing to hear celebrities and influencers, not to mention politicians, claim that technological solutions exist that can scan conduct for forbidden expression without breaking into an encryption. Now, I'm not a celebrity or an influencer, but I do know tech, and I will state for the record that there is no such thing. It is simply not possible. Either these people are badly misinformed, in a deep and concerning state of denial, or dangerously cynical hoping that by promising a nonsense tech solution, they will get laws passed and implement surveillance before anyone is the wiser. Whatever it is, let's be clear. Encryption either works for everyone or it's broken for everyone. There is no such thing as a safe backdoor. And when encryption is broken in a world so reliant on digital communications, the fundamental right to privacy is all but washed away, along with the security and robustness of the digital infrastructures that commerce, government, and civil society rely on. This, again, is why I am grateful to Edry for their work. These are not dry technical issues that belong in a sidebar at some tech policy breakfast. These are fundamental to a livable future, and right now we're facing renewed and vitriolic attacks on privacy that will take real resolve to contest. In Hungary, gay and trans people are being singled out and criminalized alongside LGBTQ literature and expression. In the US, where I live, we have a proposed law in the state of South Carolina that would punish people with death for receiving criminalized reproductive health care. And across the states, we're seeing proposals to criminalize same-sex marriage, with some even floating a ban on interracial marriage. Why do I mention these? Because in the future, too many want. This is the banned expression, the forbidden love, the impermissible identities that your client-side scanning would be tasked to detect, that your magical backdoors will be used to suss out, that your regime of bulk mass surveillance will be applied to punish. Jessica Burgess, a 41-year-old mother from Nebraska, already knows some of this future. In 2022, Facebook handed messages between Jessica and her daughter to law enforcement. These were used to charge her with a felony for helping her daughter get reproductive health care in a state where such care had been made suddenly illegal. It is time to come back to reality. Complex social problems absolutely need serious redress. But using these problems as emotionally evocative pretexts to justify the elimination of privacy will not solve them. Indeed, the measures being considered in Europe, the UK, and beyond, however noble the language justifying them appears, will pave the way for dark futures. With that, I'll close by saying I am proud to stand with all of you. I am proud to work every day to ensure that private, safe, and intimate communication remains accessible to everyone. And one last time, I want to thank EDRI members for your invaluable work and say happy birthday. <laughs>